how this plays out. I remember um, years ago, I, I would go around and facilitate Course in Miracles groups in Cincinnati. And one time there was this little hole in the wall kind of store called Whatever Works Wellness Center. <laughs> and I, I would walk by there and I go, oh cool, Whatever Works Wellness Center. And I got to met, meet the owners, Connie and Vince, and they would have little uh, baskets for people to give to people who were having health challenges or sickness. And it had flowers and it had candy. It had typical things that you might take to somebody to cheer them up uh, if they were sick. And it had books, uh, metaphysical books stuck in these baskets. One of them was a, a Bernie Siegel, a medical doctor, uh, and his, some of his books that he and his wife had put together. And they asked me to facilitate a Course in Miracles group at their center. So I did that, and I would go in and do that, and then after maybe a couple months or so, I went home and the Spirit said, now there's going to be some mail waiting for you uh, in your mailbox, and this is going to be a very important lesson. So I went and got the mail, and sure enough there was two letters. And I sat down and the Spirit had me open the first one, and it was somebody who was, it was a very tiny little course group I had, but they had written this glowing, glowing letter of Oh, there's, we've never seen anyone so loving and kind and clear as you, and da 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 da. da. So I had to go through the whole letter. It was just praises, 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 and compliments, compliments, compliments. You know, just one side, the other side. Then I opened up the other letter, and it was from someone in the same group <laughs> at the same center, whatever works well in the center. And it was like, who do you think you are? You are the most arrogant, self-centered, da 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 And I just went through the whole thing and it was just loaded with criticisms. And then the Spirit said, now, <laughs> I want to work with you so that you have the, the same experience with both letters. Because one seemed to be extremely positive and one seemed to be extremely negative. The Spirit was saying, it's all thoughts, and you have to be able to forgive or release the compliments just as easily as forgiving and releasing the criticisms. So, uh, about a, a couple years later I went to uh, Indiana, across the, the border from Ohio, and I, I was at a, uh, a Course in Miracles conference at a beautiful retreat center called La Serena. And I was just there and uh, they had a couple different speakers, but uh, they had John Mundy uh, had come flown in to, from Monroe uh, to New York to speak there and, and with his partner at the time, Diane Burke. It goes back quite a few years when they used to have a magazine called On Course and did a lot of traveling together. So I went there and, and during the retreat John spoke to me and he said, I really feel you have a deep grasp of A Course in Miracles and I'd like you to speak for maybe ten minutes to the group. And so I did and what came through in those ten minutes was, was quite uh, surprising to a lot of people, although I was just willing to have whatever come through. But basically I spoke for ten minutes on forgiving the good. And uh, at the end of it, um, John came to me later and he just said, that was very profound and, and I really would like to, uh, to talk to you more about this. Then he flew back to New York City where he had interfaith fellowship and had a little, uh, you know, he, would, he and Diane would, uh, they'd been trained by a rabbi in this interfaith and, and they had a pretty much a course community there in New York City. And John called me up on the phone and he said, actually, I would like to do a sermon on forgiving the good. And I'm a little apprehensive uh, about this because I don't know exactly how this will be received. But if you could just give me some quotations from the course uh, that I can use in my sermon, I'm going to put together this forgiving the good uh, sermon. So, I said, fine, so I gave him some quotations of where to go in the book, 
to find the forgiving the good uh, teachings. I gave him the goods <laughs> on forgiving the good. So, he, so then I waited a couple more weeks and he calls me and he, you know, he, he had his sermon, he put it in the bulletin, you know, the whole thing, forgiving the good, and he had all the quotes and everything. And I said, well, how did it go? And he said, oh, it was the worst reaction uh, I've ever seen. Uh, he said, it was, nobody liked it. Uh, probably, you know, lost a couple of the congregation over the whole thing. And this and that. It was just was not popular. Uh, and years ago in the 1990s, I used to joke with the students that I had back in the 1990s, I, I would give them titles of workshops to do that I, I said, if you really want to do a Course in Miracles workshop that will be very, very poorly attended, uh, then I would say, and here's your title, Healing the Pleasure, you know, Healing the Pleasure. And they would be like, oh. It was, it was a version of forgiving the good, uh, because when you really get into the depth of the teaching about the positive and the negative, you do start to realize from the teachings that pleasure and pain are both part of the ego's defenses against the joy of heaven or the, the peace of God. That, that that's one of the reasons why the spiritual journey can seem to take so long is because the ego has invented its own positive. And that positive is a defense against discovering the truth of who you are. In fact, I've said to people, if, if the world was just completely painful experiences for you, if you just, if everything you did was like being in an electric chair, <laughs> Uh, everything. Eat a piece of bacon, <laughs> uh, have a strawberry sundae, <laughs> uh, you know, if you were, like they used to, you know, in psychology, shock the rats, you know, just zap them and zap them and zap them until they just kind of were despondent and they, like, what's the point? I get a good zap out of everything I try to do. I go to get some food, zap, I try to go out for some exercise, I get a zap. If you got zaps for everything, Zap for the positive, zap for the negative, zap for the pleasure, zap for the pain. At some point you would go, okay, enough, I've had enough of this world, I want to know my true reality. But the sneaky part is the ego invents the pleasure to keep you trapped in the duality of the positive and the negative, mm -hmm. the pleasure and the pain. So, so it's, it's the thing where you go deeper into the teachings, you start to realize that Jesus' section on, on attraction to guilt, which he's got in his, in his text, if you start to dig into that section, you start to realize that he says, in these sections in the Course, he, said, he says, sin shifts from pleasure to pain and back and forth. It just shifts form. It morphs, to use a kind of a, from Power Rangers, a more modern terminology that the kids can relate to. Sin morphs basically back between pleasure and pain to keep the mind trapped and stuck in the duality. And the pleasure seems attractive and the pain seems very unattractive. So you might say that, that if you would go through philosophy, there's a there's actually a branch of philosophy called hedonism. And some of you have heard of hedonism. It's basically maximize the pleasure and minimize the pain. That's what hedonism is about. It doesn't get you to bliss. In fact, it just keeps you on the, we'll say, the wheel, the so-called karmic wheel that they talk about in the East. So this really is a key point, this idea of the positive, that that just to go for positive thinking without understanding a metaphysical context and without understanding the tricks that the ego has going on in the mind, then it doesn't really bring you release. The ego has pushed many beliefs out of awareness, we could say, into the subconscious mind, and it doesn't want these beliefs ever raised to awareness, because if they ever get raised to awareness, the ego is out of business. Uh, you know, it wants to perpetuate its illusory existence. It doesn't want to be seen as, as a puff of nothingness and laughed at. 
and, and have you release your mind and awaken to the reality of the Kingdom of Heaven, it wants, it wants it to stay stuck and trapped. So, the, the belief that, that pleasure and pain are different, that one is attractive and one, one is, is an aversion, is a belief that the ego pushes down. And Jesus comes along and he's got one sentence in the text that says, it is impossible to seek for pleasure without finding pain. You see, his one sentence raises that up into <coughs> awareness and says, let's make the connection here. And, as I was saying before, if the world was nothing but painful experiences for you, you could drop it faster than dropping a hot potato. You know, it would be like, ah, no. But because of this unconscious belief, you know, it's not seen, you know, for what it is. And therefore, the pleasure will take many, many different forms, as many, many side roads. And people will say, well, it felt pretty good, you know. It can be, it could be any form of that. It could be.